Well, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, seminar, Friday seminar. Uh, today we have Xie Hu uh, to give a talk for us. So before her talk begins, I'll give her, uh, I mean, give you guys an introduction to her and, and then um, she'll talk about like 45 minutes and we'll have uh, questions. Uh, so Xie Hu uh, received her uh, bachelor's degree in geoinformation science from China University of Geoscience, Wuhan and her master's degree in remote sensing from Wuhan University in China. Uh, she then came to Dallas, Texas and acquired her PhD degree in geophysics from South Methodist University. And after graduation, she went to California and worked as a postdoc at UC Berkeley uh, before she joined the University of Houston as an assistant professor. And now she's an assistant professor at Peking University. Uh, during her PhD and a postdoc uh, and as an assistant professor, she was being really productive she has uh, 15 papers published, uh, including 10 first author papers. Uh, her research got funded by multiple programs uh, from NASA. Uh, and meanwhile, she became a mom of two. Uh, she's invited here today to give a talk uh, entitled Ground Deformation and Alternations uh, Associated with Geohazard and Shallow Processes. Okay, time's yours. Yeah, thanks, Java, Java for introduction. So hi, everyone. I'm Xie from Peking University. And today I'm going to talk about ground deformation and using the similar tool as Xiaohua and Anne, Jin Yi group using. And I mainly focus on the geohazards and shallow process. And the data we are using are synthetic aperture reader, or we call SAR, as an active remote sensing uh, tool. That uh, sensor emits electromagnetic wave to the ground and receive the backscattering signals and it can somehow penetrate the clouds and rain so it can obtain data in all weather and all day conditions. And the width of the image swath covers a few hundreds kilometers and the carrying satellites have regular orbital cycle. The generally used SAR data are working at three wavelengths, X, C, and L, and they are comparable to the scale range of the rulers. The shortest X band is, more, is the most sensitive to small displacement. However, when the displacement becomes large, such as for the cold seismic displacement, the phase aliasing might be awkward for the X bands results. In this way, we will prefer to use the longer wavelengths L band. On the other hand, the longer the wavelengths, the better the penetration. So for the vegetated carrot uh, areas, we will prefer to use the L band for the INSAR mapping if the data are available. The SAR data are in complex format and composed of the amplitude and the phase. So amplitude suggests that dielectric constants can be used for the can be used for mapping the flood or the inundation for the rapid emergency response. And phase indicates the round trip traveling distance between the sensor and ground surface. When we have repeat star imagery and due to inflammatory, we can measure the ground deformation along the oblique lump site. And we usually will use the external digital elevation model to simulate the topography component and get it removed from the infrograms. And after that, one fringe in the infrogram corresponds to half wavelengths of deformation measured along the lamp site. So this system is working like a remotely sensed ruler and can capture the deformation at centimeter to millimeter accuracy. So here, the interferon contains not only the deformation, but also the artifacts from the atmosphere and all its topography and other noise. Especially for the atmosphere, it can be really complicated. Uh, for example, the phase components that's incurred by the troposphere, troposphere and ionosphere can, be, can represent contrast uh, signals in the interferograms. But the good thing is that those signals or the artifacts have different spatial and temporal characteristics. For example, the atmospheric phase screen and the orbital area are strongly correlated in space. 
and uncorrelated in time. And the topographic error can be represented by the spatial baseline using this equation. So the baseline refers to the distance between the repeat past satellites. So as long as we have multiple acquisitions, we can generate a network of inside pairs. So here each dot means uh, each acquisition and one connecting line means one inside pair. Uh, by multiple uh, inside pairs, we can further apply the spatial and temporal filters introducing weather models and uh, develop some algorithms to separate out those signals. And in essence, the time series insight analyze is the least squeal solution. Eventually, we can obtain the four dimensional displacement with 3D in space and 1D in time. As a complement of insight that relies on the phase and measured one dimensional displacement along only in the range direction or the left side direction. Pixel of that tracking can map the two dimensional displacement along both azimuth and range. And this relies on the SAR amplitude can be also applied for the optical imagery. And the theory is to compute the sub pixel offsets uh, between the image patches acquired before and after the event. And this approach heavily rely on the pixel spacing as accuracy is up to 1 20th of the pixel spacing. And considering the resolution of the satellite uh, imagery, normally this approach for the sun amplitude image uh, will be more uh, suitable to map large displacements such as the cold seismic deformation. Just to give you the thought, there are numerous geohazards and surface process associated with the ground deformation or the uh, land cover changes or the alterations. And some remote sensing had wide applications. And today I will cover a few case studies with a focus on landslides. And after landslide, I will uh, also show some case studies on the natural and the anthropogenic process, but more in the galleries style. So before we start, let's look at this picture of stool named the slump gallium. It is a mixture of uh, veggies, chia noodles, and beans. So basically it falls into the type of meal of, to clean out of the fridge. Mm -hmm. And my study site is the landslide of the same name in southwestern Colorado. It is indeed a mixture of different size and colors of soils and rocks. And it's remarkable to see the dynamic hamoki surface and various geological structures as well as a strong smell of sulfide. And it's especially magic under the condition of altitude sickness. So here, the Slangalian landslide is credited as an ideal natural laboratory because it moves at a couple of centimeters per day, and that amounts to seven meters per year. And this slip has been occurred for the past 300 years since its reactivation from the original head scarp to the new toe that is 200 meters above the state highway. And this also travels a long distance like a snake by four kilometers. So here we have uh, obtained the airborne UAV star data from NASA GPL. So although we have UAV in the name, we do have pilots and technicians for each flight mission. So here we have four independent flight lines. And we also obtained the satellite Sentinel-1 imagery collected by European Space Agency. The red and the blue boxes show the footprints of the ascending and descending tracks. And we applied hybrid INSA and pixel set tracking method and generated one, more than 1,000 pairs, which are two orders of magnitude larger than previous studies. 
And we also have in situ geodetic and hydroclimate data. So all of them help to constitute an unprecedented data collection to help us better understand the mass wasting process. So here are the black lines delineate the margins of the internal climatic elements. Uh, and this is mapped by the field survey in 1991. The first attempt of our study is to refine boundaries and we add a new climatic element in the head in the, this red line. So this can be easily retrieved from the love site displacement map obtained from Sentinel-1. And these two just ascending and descending results. So here the white means no motion and the reddish means active motion. So in the head, this northern part, so it shows us blackish color and this is in the opposite sign compared to the main string of the lens light. This is because this part is awkward on a slip against the curved flank. And say for the ascending tracks, this part is moving away from satellite, while the main string of lens light is moving towards the satellite. So they have a, a different uh, sign in terms of the lamp side displacement. Well, the middle part moves too fast and it exists the resolvability of things are when using Sentinel-1, so we don't have results here. As for the toe area, we can see distinct colors. This is because the northern tip of the toe occurred on a local inclined slope. So when we project it into the lamp side, uh, they show different uh, magnitudes. And here are the infrarms from the UAV star. And I believe they are a really good example to illustrate the importance of perspective. So here they show exactly the same displacement field span seven days. We can see when the love side is indicated by the arrows, when the love side direction it's normal to the slip direction. Uh, we see uh, negligible phase changes or the color changes. However, when the love sites are more aligned with the slip direction, we can see pronounced and clear uh, phase changes. And in another example, span longer time, 16 days in the programs, uh, all four perspectives can vividly capture the phase changes but there are a lot of face jumps at the bar, at the margins, uh, internal margins between those schematic elements. Uh, and they're obviously, obviously challenging for the face unwiping. Face unwiping is to extract, is to stretch the face value from minus pi to pi to the kind of unlimited, do not set a limit bound. So this phenomenon just inspired us to um, propose a method that we can delineate the margins from uh, locate by locating the high phase gradients. So this automatic approach can be applied to the original interferograms before unwrapping. So we can introduce more interferograms with longer time span, and we don't need to worry about if they can be unwrapped correctly or not. So this approach, uh, this here's the results. The reddish pixels means high phase gradients and the external margins can be mapped very well. It also shows the tip of the toe advanced by about 40 meters in the past 20 to 30 years compared to its location mapped in 1991. We also see the shift of the internal boundaries at the toe to the north by 50 meters. And there is an outstanding patch in the lower part of the landslide, and this represents an internal mini slide. So here the high resolution LIDAR DM suggests a proper basin formed at the shear lateral, uh, the lateral shear surface of this mini slide. So this proper basin is formed under the 
condition of the right lateral, uh, subparallel right lateral strikes the thoughts moving at a net rate of five millimeter per day. And dimension of this mini slide uh, are 30 by 10 meters and acute angle is about 30 degrees and center depressed by up to four meters. So all those geometric parameters scaled with the probabilisms in much larger tectonic regimes. So here we see the streams incised in the internal toe of this mini slide and also together with abrupt increase in the slope angle, as well as appreciable extension at the lateral margin due to the normal faulting and probabilism, all help to establish the climatic environment for the formation of this secondary structure. So here, the detailed displacement map reveals the horizontal rotation over the head and confirms the advanced movement of the toe. The time series displacement of the rail with three extensometers installed at the lateral shear surface. And then we extract the longitudinal velocity uh, from the, a total of 77 transverse profiles from head to the toe. And we pick up the longitudinal slip rate as the y axis, and we use the transverse distance of one kilometer as the x axis. And we note the narrow is the neck of the landslide, has the largest rate by up to 14 millimeter per day. Somehow the landslide uh, speed is controlled by its rheology, and we have two pieces of evidence. So first is from this picture we took at the distal toe. So we see the active toe is keep overriding the stable off-slide area and pushing and destroying the trees in front of it, which immediately remind us of the uh, frontal non-Newtonian flow. And the second piece of evidence uh, from the inclinometer surveys, and we have two surveys and two inclinometer surveys installed from the surface to five meters depth and five to 10 meters depth. And it records the internal shear deformation compared to the bottom sensor. The bottom sensor and we see negligible deformation in the shallow five meters and the mount only reach 20 millimeter during this uh, 43 days at depths five to 10 meters depth. However, during this time, the ground surface moved by as large as uh, 600 millimeter compared to the stable offside area. So this suggests that the high rate we observed at surface and mainly comes from the lower year zone and the shallow part is like a pseudo plug. So that's again suggests a non-Newtonian flow. And this equation generates the stress condition. The tau C is the year stress at the year surface. In the most commonly used Bingham model, the tau C is a constant and power law index N equals one. However, there will be no flow region at sites as they are too shallow to drive the flow. But from our extensometers installed at the lateral shear surface and sub profiles, we both see that uh, the displacement are continuous until the sites. So we up to the power law model, we are both with the pseudo plug and gradually change into the year zone below. We also propose a normal description for the slope channel and it includes three geometric parameters, the depth at the central axis and the steepness between the basal and the lateral surface and the tilt of the basal bed. So we allow for a symmetry. And then we come back to the toe area. So here the gray lines shows the off slide stable area. So here the purple lines shows the uh, active toe area. So we, from the uphill projection of the topography, we can simulate the basal beds for the toe, the distal toe area. So as we can infer the thickness for the last two profiles. 
And we also know the average density of the length time material and the slope angle. So we can invert for the power law coefficient k and m. And then we can further invert for the slope channel geometry for each of the profile as shown in the brown curve. And below the black and underlying gray lines show the surface deformation from subservation and our model. And the color figure to the right shows the modeled subsurface velocity. So here the x axis means the magnitude and y is the depth of the height from the bottom. And the color means the vertical gradient of the longitudinal slip rate. So we see the bottom has zero velocity, but the largest gradient in red color. And the shallow part has very little change in the vertical direction. And that's again suggested the uh, viscoplastic behavior. And the animation at the bottom are the results for each profile. And this diagram summarizes the geometric parameters. So here the gray line shows the depth. So the neck has the thickest lens lights by 25 meters. And here the orange line shows the tilt of the bed. So we see the uh, there's a abrupt increase in the bed tilt between the head and the neck. That is in this big band zone of stretching. This is bending. So that suggests uh, there are more asymmetry uh, in the slope channel. So here, this figure just illustrates the surface and subsurface geometry so we can estimate the landslide volume precisely. In terms of the temporal behavior, we collect the daily precipitation and see no evident regulation. And then we apply the temperature-based model and data simulation to separate out the rainfall and the snow melt. And we consider them together as the fluid water recharge into the landslide system. For each water year, calendar year, we see two highs, two peaks. And that corresponds to the uh, snow melt in the spring and rainwater in the fall. In the multi-annual time scale, we see 2013 and 2018 are two low water years. And then we see how landslide responds to the hydroclimate variability. From the Sentinel-1 TM series, uh, we pick up a target over the head in circle. It shows pronounced slowdown in response to the low water year of 2000, 2018. But this trend is not evidence for the target we pick up from the tow area. And then we uh, compile the displacement in August for this consecutive years and represent as a percentage uh, in changes as the y-axis and we use elevation for the x-axis. We note the lower part of landslides uh, the tall area decelerates by 45%, while the upper part decelerates by 70 to 90%. So it suggests that the uh, landslide sensitivity to the uh, precipitation are position dependent. For the longer time frame, your visa results from 2011 to 2018, we apply a statistic model to quantify and differentiate the speed, speed up and the slow down process for the 12 kinematic elements. Because 2013 and 2018 are two low water years and that encourage us to separate out th three time spans and you use their respective time series to constrain the coefficients here and we Note the first and the third time frames, uh, they have negative k suggesting deceleration, and that is in contrast to the middle time frame of acceleration. It's also interesting to see that no matter acceleration or deceleration, the head of the landslide always occupied larger magnitude or the absolute value of the k. We believe this is because the head is very shallow, so the pressure comes sooner and in greater magnitude. So the 
this part of landslide is more sensitive. So that's about the Slumgallian landslides. And next is another case study on the Cascade landslide complex. So this complex always attracts the tourists and geoscientists with the legend the bridge of the gods. In the early 15th century, the ancient Bonneville landslide area dammed the Columbia River and formed a natural bridge so the Native Americans could walk across the river by feet. It was later breached by the flood, but we can still see the remnants on the tow area. And the most recent failure event is a Greenleaf Basin rock avalanche occurred on January 3rd, 2008 at the head slurp. And here is totally collapsed, so the face becomes uh, used, uh, is not useful anymore. So we turn to the amplitudes. And for two independent uh, tracks, we note abrupt decline uh, in amplitude in the end of 2007, suggesting that the incipient motion or the cracks of this event uh, might occur one month prior to the reported date. For the other part of the landslide, we can still rely on insight, that is the face information to retrieve the displacement. And we also obtained the semi-continuous GPS uh, on the active landslide body. And we converted three-dimensional GPS into the lab site of the descending and ascending tracks of the Sentinel-1 and they show very good consistency. And we also note the progressive motion uh, characterized by the uh, incipient slope normal subsidence. And that occurred about 140 millimeter of rainfall collected since the rainfall season started. And thereafter, once about 270 millimeter of rain collected in less than one month, more drastic downslope slip occurred. So here we complied ascending and descending tracks from different uh, star satellites to uh, constrain the three-dimensional surface displacement. And here color means the vertical displacement. And this part um, has the, the biggest uh, subsidence by eight centimeters per year. And this is also where the largest horizontal motion occurred towards the riverside and to the north part. And that can reach up to 40 centimeters, centimeters per year. And then we use this as the input to invert for the landslide thickness based on the governing equation of mass conservation. And we use a rheological parameter F to characterize the depth average velocity using the surface velocity. And this equation states that the mass flux divergence is balanced by the rate of thickness change. The result shows that the thick zone terminates abruptly against the subsurface escarpment masked out by this cross hatched zoom. And then we can invert for inferred landslide volume. And more recently, we are working on the uh, landslide in the East uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and we obtained the first complete three-dimensional displacement in this critical zoom. So it shows clearly the slow-moving landslides and the creeping hill fault shoulder by shoulder. So here the horizontal strain map suggests the potential slope failure at the intersection between the horizontal extension in blue and the contraction in red. And we also extracted the uh, cross fault profile and that can help us to reconcile the fault kinetics. And hyperpower engineering can also trigger active landsliding, such as in the Lashua hyperpower station in China. And the water level increased due to impoundment uh, in 2009. So here, the width of the river increased from 70 meters to 150 meters. 
and the lower part of the slope being submerged under the water and cracks formed in the upper part of the slope and uh, collapse gradually. To maintain and to enhance the stability of this slope, and the impoundment was stopped since 2015. However, from our observations, it still shows active motion for this slope. But the hydrological forcing has been shifted from the reservoir water level to the seasonal rainfall uh, in the year of 2015. So you can see that before 2015, the reservoir water level uh, is perfectly correlated with a cumulative displacement with a zero day uh, shift. But after that, we see evident seasonal deformation and that's correlated to the seasonal rainfall. So that's about the landslides. And next is about some case studies. And the first is uh, about the Salt Lake Valley. It contains vigorous aquifer systems and can be generally classified into the water recharge and discharge area. So here the brown shades uh, are, many are, are many located in, at the front of the Wasatch Range. So here is, contains uh, abundant snow melt from the mountain and being recharging to the aquifer system and hydraulic gradient is downward. On the other hand, the, in the lower parts of the valley in the green shades, and there is the discharge area. So here the groundwater will migrate into the surface, uh, either the Great Salt Lake or the Jordan River. And also the Salt Lake Valley is located in the east margin of the Basin Range province. And GPS observation shows up to 1.6 millimeter per year of extension encompassing the Wasatch for the zone. And here uh, also remarkably, and this Salt Lake Valley uh, is in between two remnants of prehistoric Lake Bonneville, the Great Salt Lake and the Utah Lake. And on the, uh, to the Western part of this valley, uh, the Ocker Mountain contains the biggest man-made excavation, the Bingham Canyon mine, about 20 kilometers north of it. And the mine company established a tailless impoundment to contain the economic waste. So here, the Salt Lake City segment of the Wasatch Fat Zone has a recurrence interval of about 1400 years. And now it's due for a big one. So the Magna earthquake, uh, magnitude 5.7 Magna earthquake, uh, in March 2020 is not a complete surprise. And also interestingly, and in it's hypercenter and uh, uh, the location coincides with the Tiananmen impoundment. So here we note two um, micro seismicity clusters and the western one uh, is where the hypercenter occurred, uh, believed to be associated with the west deep in district was such for some. And the eastern cluster falls into the graben formed by the west and east dipping uh, seismogenic structures. And just be, uh, on the top of this graben, in the shallow part, there's an aquifer system. So up to now, from the reading literature, we note the fault geometry in the Hannibal are complicated and have inconsistent interpretations. So in our later stress analyze, we will consider both west and east deep in geometries. So here uh, we systematically analyze the pearl elastic and elastic source of the deformation uh, and the stress perturbations. And as for the pearl elastic source is mainly represented by the aquifer volume stream. Well, the source for the elastic will be more diverse, such as from the uh, aquifer, the Great Salt Lake, the Utah Lake, and regional soil moisture and the snow. Uh, we also considered the mass transfer from the mine to the tailings impoundment 
since uh, 1906. So first about the aquifer from the early an analyze about the NVSAT uh, satellite data, we note uh, this area of interest uh, has a strong seasonal deformation and the amplitude can reach about 40 to 50 millimeter. And this part is well contained in the water discharge part of the aquifer and bounded by the faults. From the discontinuity in the displacement field, we can identify new fault segments. Now here, the seasonal displacement can be uh, correlated with the waveform from the water discharge and water recharge. That is the precipitation, a major source of the water recharge. So here, the regular seasonal displacement provide us a new solution to estimate the water storage. And that's by solving the storage coefficients. And it described the amount of water drained from the aquifer system with per unit decline in, in the water head. And it can be computed by correlating the uh, vertical displacements in blue lines and the water level in yellow lines. So here from the spatial, the spatial interpolation, we can generate this map of storage coefficient. We also digitized the ISO patch map of the unconsolidated and the semi-consolidated layers so as to infer the thickness of the uh, aquifer system. And then we can further compute the bulk compressibility. So at this stage, as long as we have inside-observed displacement, we can estimate the water storage on the corresponding dates. And more recently, we analyzed ascending and descending tracks of the more recent, uh, the Sentinel-1 data, and that spans from 2015 to 2018. We compare it with the uh, GPS and this located on the northern tail of this aquifer system, and they show very good consistency. And the seasonal displacement magnitude, the amplitude are similar by 40 millimeter. You can also see the Jordan River cutting through the aquifer and disturb the displacement field. So here we have ascending and descending results. And I'd like to note one fundamental limitation of space bone INSAR due to the polar orbiting system and side looking geometry, the left side measurement are not sensitive to the north-south displacement. So a generally practice is to make assumption that the north-south component in the left side displacements are negligible. In this way, we can uh, constrain the two dimensional displacement in the vertical and east-west direction. So here for the, uh, for the five years displacement rate, when we pick up the reference point uh, to the west of this valley, we can see the eastern part subside is uh, subsiding by a couple of millimeter per year. And this spatial distributions can be explained by the water level decline by 12 meters during 1985 to 2015. Well, here the seasonal displacement amplitude, say for the winter time, this aquifer is uplifting by 50 millimeter with horizontal east-west extension by 30 millimeters. So this follows the Poro elastic uh, deformation. So comply with the storage coefficient we obtained in previous study, we infer that storage change in the water storage amounts to 0.03 to 0.06 cubic kilometers. And then we apply the analytical and uh, numerical models to uh, compute the Coulomb stress changes due to the seasonal volume strain of the aquifer system. And we note, although in the shallow part adjacent to the aquifer system, the current stress changes can be hundreds of kilopascal, but at the seismogenic depth, 
deeper than 10 kilopascal, that only amounts to up to 10 kilopascal. And the second environment of the stress changes at the hypercenters are mostly less than two kilopascal. And compare with the background tectonic loading rates of 15 kilopascal per year, we consider the volume strain of the aquifer system can hardly uh, alter the seismicity, uh, can, or, can hardly to trigger, really trigger uh, the tectonic or the earthquakes in this region. So here as for the elastic stress analyze, we pick up, uh, pick up this east-westing transect and it's uh, passing through the uh, southern part of the resort lake, the town's impoundment, the epicenter. Uh, here is the aquifer system and the surface trace of the Wasatch Fasson. And we consider two representative seismogenic structures, the low angle west dipping and the high angle east dipping in these two rows. And the first the columns indicate um, the stress changes due to the Great Salt Lake drawdown by two meters since, two thousand, since uh, 1900. Um, this unloading unclimbs the fault, but the column stress increase in the hypercenter zone are up to three kilopascal. The second column indicates the cumulative uh, oral deposition by three million ton can, can produce hundreds of kilopascal stress changes in the shallow part, but that amount will be uh, decreased abruptly with depths uh, at a hypercenter depth that will be only about 45 kilopascal. But the sign will be opposite for this two geometry. And the third columns suggest the, the column stress changes due to the signal aquifer loading will be only 0.5 kilopascal. So take home message just from this slide is that the uh, elastic stress perturbations from the Tiananmen impoundment, Tiananmen's uh, deposition uh, from the industrial process can be much larger, a couple of orders of magnitude larger than that from the hydrological source. As for the Tiananmen impoundment itself, there are at least three embankment failures and we use the three uh, satellites to map the displacement fields and they both agree with the compaction peak, uh, which is located at the northeast corner. But the rate has been decreased from, from 200 millimeter per year during 2014, uh, 2004 to 2011 to 100 millimeter during 2015 to 2016. And we also applied a a geotechnic model to simulate the five-dimensional displacement in space, time, and settlement process. And, and this displacement uh, profiles can be well explained by INSA observations. And generally, it's a decelerating as the pressure gradually dissipates, and this model can also predict its development. So that remote sensing can also be used to directly to monitor the dynamic, uh, dynamic underground coal mines, such as here in the Shanxi, China. So this animation suggests uh, the migration of the subsidence, and that is corresponds to the walking phase. And together with the uh, what uh, groundwater anomalies and later uh, the recovery. We suspect the macro faults and formed when the walking phase approached. And after that, the stress got released to promote the fault killing. And here in the Yang'an, uh, in Yang'an in China is actually experience, is experiencing the unprecedented man-made exca excavation. Uh, and people also say this is a huge surgery to the uh, crustal to the earth system. So here um, the government is cutting the hills and filling the gullies and the surface topography has been changed by miners to 
positive 18 meters. And our INSA observation suggests that there will be more, uh, there will be higher subsidence rates in the areas with more fields. And our statist statistical analysis suggests that it needs uh, one decade uh, to reach uh, the stabilized uh, condition. So SAS remote sensing can also used to map the plate boundary scale deformation. So here are the results provided by uh, modified from the uh, time series displacement provided by Xiaohua. So in California, statewide California, uh, we synergize uh, more than 20 interdisciplinary data set using the uh, machine learning algorithms to characterize the deformation due to tectonic, uh, hydrological, and uh, anthropogenic activities. And we note that there's a narrow range of the vegetation fraction uh, coincides with the high strain rate along the, hand, along the San Andreas Fault. And also, I'm working with my students uh, to use a machine learning to characterize the snow depth uh, for the past winter storm in this February for the statewide Texas. Especially we used the SAR coherence to generate the damage proxy map and we compare uh, and we also combine the other external data such as from the land cover, temperature, etc. And we uh, generate this map of snow depth. And we compare our results with the uh, field measurements, and they show high accuracy at 94%. So lastly, to recap my uh, research, so I'm mainly uh, using mountain disciplinary data from ground, air, and space with a focus of SAR remote sensing to generate uh, the in firearms and get the time series displacement. And then I will apply the statistical and analytical numeric models as well as machine learning to help us uh, constrain the geometry uh, and to better understand the uh, triggering mechanism of those process and their environmental forcings. And the ultimate goal of my research is to better understand the geohazards in the shallow process in the geodetic time scale. And lastly, I'd like to thank my uh, advisor, Roland and uh, John at Berkeley and SMU, as well as other collaborators. And also thanks to the data providers and grant agencies. So I'd like to stop here and uh, open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Xie. Uh, really excellent talk. Uh, uh, if, if anyone or you have any questions, uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Or uh, if you want, you can type it in the chat. I, I, I can uh, ask a question for you. Any questions? I'll, I'll start with my, my own question, maybe. Mm -hmm. so, so for the uh, landslide that you studied, uh, 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 it moves really fast, like seven meters a day. And for like 300 seven years meters now. per year, seven yeah. meters per year for 300 years now. So yes. uh, if you if you uh, multiply that, that'll be almost half of the length of the total landslide, right? Yes, I think this is the most remarkable one. So, so my question mm -hmm. is like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't the mass be depleted uh, at the head? Or where are, are, the, are the new masses coming into the, the landslide? Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, so uh, there is uh, one paper to suggest that they will, the, this landslide system is going to be slowed down because there's no uh, mass material being fitting uh, into the landslide system because the head won't be uh, continuously provide such abundant materials. Also, uh, so this is one argument. Um, so for me, uh, I do, uh, actually we have a, a G ground-based, that is GB INSAR, ground-based INSAR uh -huh. system installed at this position. And we only can image 
the definition here, but I, um, but I really wish we could have ground-based insight system installed here and to looking up here to just monitor the source, the source part, the sourcing part, the head scarf part of this landslide body. Yeah, but at this moment, due to uh, some instruments limitation and the trails uh, will be difficult to reach uh, a good location and to make projection up here. So we won't be able to really monitor the sourcing part. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but over the observation time here that you had, like basically like the past 10 years, do you see any evidence that is slowing down or Maybe this is too short of a time period. Yeah, so we, we uh, in terms of the climate change, we won't be, uh, I think we only have uh, seven years data, but we do have a strong correlation with precipitation. Okay. Uh, so here's the front second one, even just for these two years, we see our pronounced slowdown. And here for the VV sub, we have seven years. And the, we can see that the rates can be uh, correlated with the uh, food water recharge and when we compute it to the, and that's, uh, that follows the pro pressures. Yeah, the normal, the pro pressure follows the precipitation so as to control the landslide speed. So we do find their correlation. Okay. Um... Any questions from the audience? Hi, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So for the final part, it may be early since you said it uh, at the very end, the snow map, the snow depth map in Texas. Okay. Um, you said INSAR coherence went into that. Um, were there other mm -hmm. uh, radar-based uh, inputs to the machine learning model or how, how would uh, coherence uh, lead okay. to a depth? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a good question. So here we use, uh, so here we use SAR data to generate the coherence, and then we um, compute the differential coherence. Uh, differential coherence can represent how much changes uh, of the surface materials. So we collected the uh, pairs before prior to the event and uh, during the event, and we made a subtraction to generate, to generate this damage proxy map. So the damage proxy map is not new to, to INSAR community, but it's usually used to, uh, for the rapid response to the earthquake, and to the wildfires or the hurricane. But uh, uh, as far as we know, it has been, uh, it has never been used to characterize such major disaster due to snow melt. Uh, we do not use other, uh, like the radar data, like the, the weather data, but we collect it. Uh, we do not use other image products, but we use the uh, field measurement. So here the dots are the field measurements and we interpolate uh, those results to get a map. Okay. And we use this data set as the input uh, and use this two uh, machine learning algorithm to generate the snow depths. Okay. And here, here the white dots means the uh, field measurements for us to make a comparison. Do you think it would work in an area that's covered in snow for most of the year, like say in the mountains of uh, the West Coast? Or does uh, it only work for this freak snowstorm? In that way, then we won't be able to generate sensible uh, damage prox map. So because damage prox map requires changes in the surface material, either it's collapse or the flood, or there's uh, some changes, they need to have some changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I actually have another question. I yes. Asked. So, so for the aquifer system that you observed that uh, you, you did a decomposition to east-west and uh, mm -hmm. so vertical, um, 
this fat mm-hmm. seasonal one that looks sort of okay to me, but there seems to be a, I mean, for the long term in the east, seemingly it's sliding toward uh, the eastern side. Okay, you mean this one? Yeah, this red blob over there. Sliding towards the east. I think it's a valid signal okay. because we do observe similar things for the Central Valley, where the entire western side of Central Valley is sliding toward east. Um, despite the seasonal looks like it's shrinking or, or expanding, depending on whether it's being loaded or, or unloaded, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So do you, have you ever thought about any kind of mechanism for this type of deformation? Why it's moving mm-hmm. one-sided in the long run? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, for the long-term part. So first, uh, it needs to note we our reference points are here. So yeah. you can imagine if we pick up reference points here, so okay, radish will we are gone, right? Yeah, I know, I know. Like relatively yes. speaking, yeah. Yes, relatively measurements. And the other thing is that uh, perhaps it's will uh, there are some also poor elastic part in the uh, this multi annual rate. That means there will be horizontal extension, but that should be behave something like this. So that will okay. you think it should be, be for the two yes, hours? Yes, there will be like we we if we use here as the if you can see my mouse, if, if we select here as the reference point, then we can see a clear extension here uh, towards two sides. Uh, but here uh, because I do not really interpret the multi-annual rates in the horizontal div- direction because I think they are below the um, signal to noise ratio. It's only uh, below one or about one millimeter per year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, so you think it's might, it might be from atmospheric noise or other noise sources? Yes, yes. I think okay. it's, uh, it's, it's below the noise threshold. Yeah, it's difficult. I have another question on the audience. Yeah, please. Um, are there any uh, active UAV SAR campaigns that you know of or are working with that are monitoring some of the landslides that you're working with? Oh, in the Air River catchment in California, uh, I think Air Handbill and uh, Air Fielding from NASA JPL, there are many working on that one. Okay. And for me, I'm many working on this one because this is a, a proposal by my postdoc advisor, Roland and Eric uh, Fielding at NASA. Okay. Yeah. So, so up to now, I'm working on this one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. And and they do you know how often they uh, revisit? Also, they stop. Um, so that's. Uh, they did won't collect any more data at uh, Slum Gallium. But okay. for the Air River catchment, perhaps it, it will continue, but uh, I'm not sure, but you can check on website. Okay. So they, there are no more UAV star data here. All right, I think uh, we're reaching to the uh, like 12 ish uh, at your time. So uh, I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> really mm-hmm. nice talk. Thanks a lot for, for giving us a talk. I know the time difference probably doesn't, I uh, mean, may not work best for you, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks. Thank you.